Well, thank you, Jocelyn. Sorry, it was a bit of a long reading, wasn't it? I should have shortened that. Good morning, everybody. just want to share with you, last Sabbath I was in New Zealand and uh, I was taking part, as some of you know, in a charity bicycle ride. We, we rode from the city of Auckland um, around the Hauraki Gulf, across the Firth of Thames, as it's known, over the Coromandel Peninsula to a place called Hahai. And that was the, the, where I was this time last Sabbath, in, so having a, a, a rest day. We had ridden 200 kilometres. That was our rest day. And um, very close to the seaside town there of Hahai is a place known as Cathedral Cove, which is where a lot of tourists like to go. So this time last week, um, that's where I was, enjoying a beautiful, relaxing time there by the sea. And um, I was took part in a, a ride with 80 other riders, and as you all know, there was even there's even a tandem in there. Check it out. Um, we raised over $170,000 for our ride. Um, I was blessed enough to raise 1,500 of that um, just through donations. So. ADRA New Zealand and ADRA Australia are some of the chief recipients of that fundraising. Um, and there are other charities that benefit from it as well. So I just want to say thank you to those who did support me in that and, and thank you for your prayers and had a wonderful time while I was over there. But of course, oh, that's, that's yours truly, having conquered the, the hill, which is known as the Coromandel Peninsula, it's Coromandel Township on the other side, that was a climb similar to going up Mount Archer, so it was pretty exhausting. But of course, New Zealand is in the news for all the wrong reasons <coughs> today, the tragedy that took place in my hometown. And perhaps feeling a little fragile and still catching up on some sleep, uh, when I heard the news yesterday, oh, I just broke down in tears to think that something like that could happen in my quiet little country town of New Zealand. It can happen anywhere. And we really need to, our hearts go out to the people of Christchurch today, to the people who were affected, their families. Um, we just have to remember those people in our prayers. And God will place his um, arms around them at this terrible time. <clears throat> I want to share with you today, a, this is another in my series on the life of David. This is perhaps the second to last one. I think it is anyway. There's so much in the life of David. This is the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. It is a Muslim mosque, an octagonal shaped building. It is situated on what is known as the Temple Mount. So the area that was leveled by um, King Herod the Great and uh, enclosed and built up and leveled for his great temple is now where this um, building sits. And of course, it's a very significant site for people uh, of the Muslim faith, but also for people of, of the Jewish faith because it, you know, it was a site of where their temple used to be. And of course for Christians it has, is very significant as well for what took place there. And if you see it from the air, <clears throat> um, it gives you some idea of the size of the Temple Mount around the building. And when you go inside, it's actually... Interesting, the very centre piece, if you like, of all that architecture is this rocky ledge. And it, it is significant to the, the people of Muslim faith because it is here that supposedly the Prophet Muhammad ascended to heaven, um, um, a particular vision that he had. And it's also for Jewish people and Christian people, it is the site that they believe Abraham offered his son Isaac up as a sacrifice. And thank you, Jocelyn, for reading that story to us this morning. But of more importance to us in the life of David is how this site came to be so important to the Jewish people. And we know from um, the books of Chronicles and Samuel that Mount Moriah, as, as Abraham is told to go and take his son up to, the mountain of Moriah, is the place that Solomon built his temple. Uh, Second Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1 tells us that, that the very site that Solomon erected the temple 
was on Mount Moriah. The story of David's being led to this site is one that is quite um, challenging for us as believers because it involves an incident where David decided he wanted to know the size of his standing army. Now this is a time where David's kingdom was at its, at its peak uh, from the Euphrates River in the north down to the Egyptian Delta in the south and east to the deserts of Arabia. This was the greatest territory that the nation of Israel ever occupied. And in the time of, of David and his son Solomon, that was the, the height of their influence in the Middle East. And David, at, at this stage in his life, perhaps considered himself his own importance more than God's. And I say that, I say that with, with some exception because he wanted to know how big his army was. Why would he want to know how big his army was? So if he had to go to war, he would know what resources were at his disposal. But what valuable lesson do you think David had forgotten of God's providence over the years? He only needed God on his side and he would win. In fact, his predecessor, King Saul, his son Jonathan, had taken on the Philistines just with his armour bearer alone and perhaps David had forgotten that, that Jonathan's armour bearer could say to him, the Lord can deliver whether by many or by few. And David in his own life had experienced enough occasions where he had seen God's deliverance miraculous deliverance against overwhelming numbers. So perhaps David was shifting his focus off of the God who could deliver, the God who could save, the God who could preserve to his own abilities and the abilities of that as a nation. And so if you want to follow with me, I'm picking up the story in 2 Samuel chapter 24 and it's titled in my Bible, David Counts the Fighting Men. And the story is also repeated in 1 Chronicles chapter 21. And they are two contrasting accounts of the same uh, episode. And one begins with the words, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel and he incited David against him saying, go and take a census of Israel and Judah. The account in Chronicles says that Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. So who do, who do we believe? Did God do it or did the devil do it? Interestingly enough, that reference to Satan is one of only three in the Old Testament. Sure, we have the allusion to him in the Garden of Eden as a serpent. We have the allusion to him as the morning star, uh, the fallen morning star in Isaiah and Ezekiel's prophecies. But this is the only one of three references to the name Satan in the Old Testament. The other, the other two, of course, come from the first two chapters of the book of Job, where Satan goes up before the Lord to represent the earth. And the other is a time much later in Israel's history where Joshua the high priest, in doing his duties, is um, accosted by Satan the accuser. And we find that in the book of Zechariah. But here Satan is, here on one hand, the book of Samuel alludes to the fact that the, it was the Lord that inspired David to take account and the writer of Chronicles said, no, 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 it was Satan that had done it. Why the difference? Well, we'll think about that in a moment. So David asks his cousin Joab to go, his, sorry, his nephew Joab to go and count the fighting men. And Joab, of all people, responds by saying, you know, may the Lord multiply our army a thousand times, but why would you want to go and do such a thing? You know, Joab, this is Joab, his, his commander of his army, who has murdered three men to get to that position. And coming out of the lips of this man is these words, why would you want to do a thing like that? Because he knows 
that God isn't going to be pleased with David for doing it. Nevertheless, David's word overrides um, Joab, and Joab goes and does a, a nine-month circuit around the kingdom that David occupies. And after nine months, he comes back, and the reports, the two accounts differ. One says that Israel had 800,000 men, and the other says he had a million 100,000. The numbers are, are irrelevant in this case. But the point is, when he gets to the tribes of Benjamin and Levi, Levi, of course, being the priestly tribe, you wouldn't count them as soldiers, Joab doesn't count them because the Bible says that David's command to him was repulsive. So here's... Joab is quite an interesting character, and, and we see this side of, a side of him that we hadn't anticipated. But now David, David is guilt-stricken. Now that he knows, prior to knowing, he could have claimed ignorance. Prior to knowing, he could have relied on God's help. But now he knows how many men over the age of 20 who can carry a sword are at his disposal. And he, the Bible tells us that immediately he was guilt-stricken. Well, it isn't very long before the prophet Gad, David's, known as David's seer, turns up and says, the Lord is displeased with you and he's giving you three options. And the three options sound pretty horrific. Three years of famine, three months of being invaded by your enemies on the run, or three days of plague. And there's no, there's no fourth option. So, None of those options appeal to David in any way because he knows that all of them involve some form of calamity. But he, is, he chooses the, the, the third. He throws himself upon the Lord's mercy and he says, let us not fall into the hands of men. Let us fall into the hands of God because his mercy is great. And so for three days, the angel of the Lord goes through the nation of Israel and 70,000 men are put to death. And when David is finally confronted, here's David living in the capital city of Jerusalem, and if you can see very faintly in that painting, there's, there's an, the angel of the Lord with his drawn sword over the city of Israel. As David is there beholding this, the, the multiple deaths that are taking place all around him, he throws himself at the Lord's mercy and says, I'm the one who has sinned here. These are but sheep. Take it out on my family. And we wonder, we wonder for a moment how it is that God could punish in such a way. And we're left scratching our heads and thinking, is this the God that, that David loves and serves? And is this the God that we love and serve as well? Well, when the angel of the Lord gets to a place that is known as the threshing floor of Aruana, the Jebusite. And of course, the Jebusites were the former inhabitants of Jerusalem. When the angel of the Lord gets to this threshing floor, and there's, um, there's whoopsie, Aruana there with his sons, and they've got the oxen out, and they're treading the grain. David turns up, and it's there that he sees the angel of the Lord with the drawn sword. And it would appear that some of the people around them are aware of this angel because Arawana's sons flee at this, time, at, this, at this point in time. And then it would appear that David hears the word of the Lord saying to the angel, Enough, withdraw your hand. In other words, the Lord himself is grieved at what is taking place and says to the angel, the destroying angel with a sword, enough. Which is probably why the writer of the Chronicles attributes it to the work of Satan and not the work of the Lord. Well, in, in stirring David up to take the census in the first place. Well, David himself gets to see this angel of the Lord with his sword drawn. And when he hears those words, enough, withdraw your hand, the next thing 
the prophet Gad comes to him and says, this is where the altar for the temple is to be built. David had it in his heart to build a temple for God. We're going to look at that story next week. David's desire was to build a temple. He knew it needed to be something fantastic, but just where to put it? And finally he gets a message from God through the prophet Ged. This is the place. Where the angel of the Lord's sword was stopped, this is the place that the altar is to be built. We know that David didn't get to build that, build that temple, but he left instructions with his son Solomon. And we know, because Solomon built it on Mount Moriah, that this threshing floor of Arowana of the Jebusite had to be on the top of Mount Moriah. So what is the significance of this story to us? When you think about the contrasting opinions or views, did the Lord inspire David to take a census and this was the result? Or did Satan inspire David to take a census and this was the result? Regardless of whom, whom initiated it, God used these circumstances to bring about the result that he desired. Whether he initiated it or the devil initiated it, it is God who is ultimately in control of what took place at that site. And you might say to yourself, how unmerciful is that, that 70,000 people should suffer or be punished for one man's sin? What are we doing when we're, when we're, we're, we're questioning God's justice when we ask that question, aren't we? We're questioning his mercy. We're questioning God's wisdom in doing such a thing. David had yet to experience the power of God that perhaps a descendant of his by the name of King Hezekiah got to experience firsthand. In the days of King Hezekiah, the armies of Babylon came and surrounded the city of Jerusalem, besieged it. <clears throat> that angel of the Lord with his sword drawn there put to death in one night 186,000 Babylonian soldiers. Perhaps David had forgotten the lesson that the Lord can deliver whether by many or by few. And so in his own lifetime, in his own kingdom, he gets to experience this firsthand. God can wipe out 70,000 people just like that. And he could probably add another 170,000 if he needed to, just like that. God needed David to learn a lesson of trust. And you might say to yourself, well, why should those innocent people have had to suffer? Perhaps they weren't as innocent, uh, sorry, perhaps they weren't as guilty as, as we may think they are. I want to consi consider this passage of scripture with you. Isaiah 57 verse 1 tells us that the righteous perish and no one pon ponders it in his heart. Devout men are taken away and no one understands that the righteous are taken away to be spared from evil. Is it possible that amongst those 70,000 people were indeed many righteous men? We know that Solomon built his temple on that very site. It was one of the wonders of the ancient world one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Temple of Solomon. Built upon that very hilltop where that rocky ledge lay, where Abraham himself had offered up his own son as a sacrifice, remember, at God's command, God asked Abraham to do something that would not be humanly possible. What father would want to take the life of his own child? He was asking the impossible of him, wasn't he? And of course that temple was destroyed eventually by the Babylonians and in its place was built this temple, the second temple as it is known and expanded and updated and refurbished and to, to be a grand um, 
piece of architecture by Herod the Great. And in the days of the Roman, the Roman Empire, the Roman emperors themselves gave gifts of gold and ivory and marble to this temple when it was being built. There were whole walls, marble walls, that would be donated by the Roman emperors. So, so much was their respect for this place. But what's interesting for us as Christians is that within this temple precinct was a little hall known as the Hall of Hewn Stones. And this is the place where the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of the Jewish nation, would meet. And usually meet to decide very serious criminal cases. And the Hall of Hewn Stones had entry doors that led from the outside into the inside of the temple precincts. And they were not supposed to make any judgment upon any man without first going into the temple for their morning prayers and to be there for the morning sacrifice. They were not to try any capital punishment case between after the hours of three in the afternoon and nine o'clock in the morning. It had to happen in that window between 9 and 3 after they had been to their morning prayers. And it was into this hall that they dragged Jesus in the wee hours of the morning on a Friday in AD 31. Contrary to their legal, their legal um, precedent, is that the word? Contrary to the... To the, the the rules that they would have followed in a capital punishment case, they dragged Jesus in there in the wee hours of the dark of the morning. And prior to that, you will recall, prior to that event, they had met some, some few weeks earlier, just a few weeks earlier, after Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. You can read this in John's Gospel. They met there once Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead and they argued amongst themselves, what are we going to do with this radical rabbi, this radical teacher from Galilee? They said, look, see how the whole world has gone after him, after the resurrection of, of Lazarus. And Caiaphas, the high priest, stood up and said, you know nothing at all. You don't realise it's better for you that one man perish, that one man die, than the whole nation perish. And it was there that day that they had already made up their minds what they were going to do with Jesus. And so while Jesus was not sacrificed on the Temple Mount, he was taken outside the city and crucified. The trial and his, his condemnation to death took place on the very site that the angel of the Lord on two occasions had had his hand stayed previous to that. If we go back to the days of Abraham, when Abraham held the knife in his hand and he was about to take his son, this time the angel of the Lord held up Abraham's hand and said, Abraham, Abraham, don't lay a hand on the boy. And what were the words that he said to him then? Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. And in the tragedy of that moment that could have played out, in the tragedy of that moment, Abraham was role-playing the very thing that God was going to have to do for you and I as his wayward children. Abraham got to see a glimpse into the heart of God, that God would not withhold his only son for you and I. And you fast forward almost a thousand years from the days of Abraham, and there's, there is David at the threshing floor of Arowana the Jebusite, 
And there the angel of the Lord has his sword raised, ready for punishment. And the Lord says, enough. Enough bloodshed. But this is the place. This is the place where the temple should be built. The temple that would keep fresh in people's minds this story of the lamb that took the place for Isaac. The lamb that took the place for Isaac. And God's lamb, his own son, took the place for you and I. The temple that would point forward to all the sanctuary services. The lamb upon the altar. The lamb of God upon the altar for you and I. When you fast forward another thousand years from David's day, and there we are, standing within the temple precincts in Jerusalem in AD 31. And having been tried and condemned there in that building, Jesus is dragged out to the hill of Golgotha just outside. And he's nailed to a cross. And as as the nail's driven into his hand, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And when he's finally hoisted up for all to see, he cries out those words, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because there was no hand to stay the angel of death that day. And God had to watch while his own son died upon a cross at the very spot where Isaac had been spared, at the very spot where David had been spared. Jesus was not spared because now we understand the heart of God who did not withhold his son, his only son, for you and I. The Bible tells us that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And while Jesus could cry out those words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus couldn't see his father in that moment. What he didn't realise was his father was right there with him. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. When you think about this story of this incident in David's life, how David came to be led to this place, did Satan inspire David to take a census or did God inspire him to do it? Regardless of the consequences, God had a purpose in bringing David to this point, to this place, because at this mountain, his son would die for the sins of this world. So whether the things that are happening in your life today, perhaps the things that are happening in your life today, you are blaming Satan for it or you're blaming God for it. I want you to know that regardless of your thought processes and who you think is responsible for the things that are happening in your life today, God can take all of our mess, all of our brokenness, and he can bring about his purposes in his time. Do you believe that? Because God has a plan. And I shared this with the young people in Sabbath school this morning. God has a plan from beginning to end. And we know that one day soon, and praise the Lord, may it be soon, because there is so much brokenness in our world. God has a plan. And that plan involves you and I. And he wants you to be a part of everything that he is doing to redeem this world. He is committed to us now, the ministry of reconciliation. It is our job in our own lives and through our own influence to tell other people the good news of Jesus and his soon coming. May God bless you.